this is going to be another question and answer video and the question was or one of the questions can a christian live like a lost person and yet still be saved and the quick answer is yes should he absolutely not because romans six fifteen says what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace god forbid so even though we should try our best to walk after godliness, our Christian walk has nothing to do with whether or not we are saved. This is a completely separate issue. The works you do before salvation are a separate issue than salvation, and the works you do after salvation are a separate issue from the salvation itself. And Paul is clear in Galatians that what a person does in the flesh after salvation is not perfecting anything. Good works can't keep you saved and don't necessarily prove you're saved because good works can be counterfeited. Galatians 3.3 says, Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? He asked that question. How are you made perfect by the flesh after you've been saved? Paul even admits that he is the chief of sinners. And if Paul believed that a Christian wouldn't sin to the point of being a chief of sinners, do you think he would have said this? He says in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying of worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So the reason you still sin is because you still have the same flesh. Nothing changed about your flesh. And many will use 2 Corinthians 5.17 in an attempt to to show a Christian won't have a sinful lifestyle after salvation, but this is off. It's off because they're forgetting about the flesh versus the spirit. But let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So the new creature there in verse 17 has nothing to do with the flesh. And that's where the confusion comes in. But that's why it is called the old man. Your flesh is called the old man in the Bible. The new creature can't be the flesh because it says all things are become new. If all things are become new, if that refers to the flesh, then it wouldn't be called the old man. Then verse 18 says all things are of God. Your flesh isn't of God. So this has to be referring to the inner man, not the outer man. These are things that have to do with the spirit and not the flesh. If your flesh is a new creature, and the next verse said all things are of God, then this would mean you didn't sin, period, if it referred to the flesh. So this has to be all things are become new, referring to the, the new man in you and not the outward man. So if the flesh is a new creature then why do you get a new body? In Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body at the rapture, we get a new body. And if the new creature of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is referring to the flesh as well, then why do we have to still get a new body? But at the rapture, we get a new body and no longer have to be bothered by this old sinful flesh and I'm not teaching these things to make you feel better about your sin. If you think I take sin lightly, then just walk with me for a while. I tend to get a bit annoying to those around me because I'm like Antipas. I'm almost against everything. And I almost find something sinful in everything because of this sin-cursed world. I'm not condoning sin at all. But Paul plainly shows us in Galatians chapter 5 what sins a Christian will end up committing if he doesn't walk in the Spirit. And the fact that he says walk in the Spirit shows he's talking to safe people because lost people can't walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now if you don't walk in the Spirit, then here are the sins a Christian will commit. In verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, 
which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So sometimes a person sees a drunk or someone shacking up and they say they are lost. They may be. They may be lost. And since many people are on the broad way to hell, it's a good chance that they are lost. But this isn't 100% right. This could be a person who got saved but is living for the flesh. As they, can, as they fornicate and commit drunkenness, what they're doing is fulfilling their fleshy desires. They're not walking in the spirit. They're walking in the flesh. And Paul makes it very clear that a Christian, it's possible for him to walk in the flesh. Look at Romans 7, another great chapter. Romans 7, 15 through 22. Paul, referring to himself, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Many times you may find yourself committing a sin that you hate when you don't want to commit that sin, and that's the flesh. That's you giving into the flesh. He says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. When you sin, it's not the new man, it's not the new creature, it's the old man. It's sin that dwelleth in you, in your flesh. He says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing see that flesh is not a new creature and there's no good thing in it he says for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i find not for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do now if i do that i would not it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me i find then a law that when i would do good evil is present with me for i delight in the law of god after the inward man your new man, the new creature, likes the things of God. The old man, the flesh, is con goes contrary to the things of God. But the new man delights in the things of God. The outer man wants to do something else. And Paul is describing a war that goes on within us. Romans 7, 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now look at what he says in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now if new creature means change life after salvation, then why is Paul a wretched man wanting to be delivered from this body of death? Paul has a new creature on the inside of this body of death, and he's ready for the rapture so that he can get rid of this vile body. Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. A vile body is not the new creature that has become new, and it is not of God. Romans 7.25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You know what else proves that some Christians live for the flesh after salvation? The judgment seat of Christ. If every Christian walked in the Spirit and shows a changed life, then how come some Christians get wood, hay, and stubble for lack of service when they get to the judgment seat? I mean, getting saved and never doing anything good is still a sin. Even if you never get drunk and commit adultery and smoke pot, a lot of Christians are living a sinful lifestyle because they don't hit a lick at a snake for God. They may not look like they are living like the devil, but they aren't doing anything, period, for God. They are simply living for the flesh and not doing any good works. Even though they are abstaining from some bad things, they don't read the Bible, they don't pray, they don't witness, they don't try to edify other Christians. And God doesn't force anyone to mortify the flesh. But Romans 8, 13 and Colossians 3, 5 tell us to mortify our flesh mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth and if you mortify the flesh then you're putting it down you're subduing it and letting it know that the new man is in charge even though a christian can live like a lost person and still be saved this doesn't mean he should and this doesn't mean there won't be consequences as romans 8 13 says for if you live after the flesh you shall die 
You're bringing yourself to an early grave by living for the flesh. You also won't do as good at the judgment seat of Christ because your lack of service, living for the flesh and lack of Christian service go hand in hand. And you'll still go into the millennial kingdom. But if you continue in sin, you won't have any cities to rule over, according to Galatians chapter 5. And unconfessed sin hurts your fellowship with God, which results in depression for the child of God. To be happy, you must be saved, and then you must live for the Lord if you want to be happy. So, can a Christian live like a lost person? Of course. But he still has the same flesh. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. You see, we're supposed to walk in good works after we're saved, not live for the flesh. Can we live for the flesh and live like a lost person after salvation? You can because you still have a free will. You still have a choice. But should you? Absolutely not. The Bible is completely against that. Now, with that being said, there are men who teach that if you don't live up to a certain standard after salvation, or if you commit a certain sin after salvation, they'll say that you really didn't get saved to begin with. And I've already said that what you do after salvation is an issue of discipleship and not salvation. You can be a, a bad Christian. I mean, you could not even act like a Christian. But then there's... Men who call themselves easy believists, and they may be, but they teach it is possible that a person can live a life of sin and be saved, which that's what I'm teaching. I believe that a saved person can live a life of sin just as bad as any lost person. You know, and people call that, you know, easy believism because that's their definition of it. And if that's the definition of it, then that's, that's true according to the Bible. But people who are easy, easy believists teach salvation is about a heart belief and nothing else. Nothing to do with works. You don't stop sinning to be saved. Uh, salvation has nothing to do with you not sinning after salvation. But yet a lot of people who call themselves easy believists, they will teach that the men who do require a changed life after salvation are lost because they add works to the gospel. So they end up doing the same thing that those guys are doing because they're saying those guys aren't saved for something that they're doing. Just like the guys that require change life after salvation, they say that if a person is a drunkard or a fornicator after salvation, they'll say he really didn't get saved. That's their belief. And then you have that guy who they call easy believists who they say, you know, a Christian could still life of sin, live a life of sin after salvation and still be saved. Yet they'll say that the guy who requires a changed life after salvation is not saved because he's adding works to the gospel. Okay, that contradicts what they believe because just because a man is teaching a false gospel does not necessarily mean that he's lost. Because look back at Galatians chapter 5. And you'll see that one of the works of the flesh that a Christian can commit is heresies. If you read the book of Galatians, you will quickly see that the Galatians had been deceived into thinking they were keeping themselves saved. They were teaching and believing heresies. To the point Paul even asks them. In Galatians 3.3, 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So it is possible for a person to believe from the heart to salvation. And then be led astray by false teachers who have a false gospel. And then they also start teaching the same false gospel that these men taught them. And they may be leading others to hell. They may be adding works to the gospel. But if there was a time when they, were, they, they had the gospel presented to them, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried and resurrected, and someone told them, to be saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and put your trust in Him to be saved, and they did that, they're saved. If they believe the simple, true gospel, they're saved, and that's that. Even if they're deceived and are teaching something that's a heresy. A Christian can be deceived. A Christian can commit sin. A Christian can end up teaching something that's completely false. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. 
It says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So they'll say, you see here, if somebody's preaching a false gospel, that automatically means that they're lost. You see, if a man who never believed the true gospel from the heart is teaching a false gospel, then he is going to hell. That is, if he doesn't get saved before he dies. But read Galatians 1, 8, and 9, the verses we just said, in light of other verses in the book of Galatians, and you'll see that some of the Galatians would have been teaching a false gospel themselves because they were deceived by these same men who were teaching this false gospel. Yet they were saved. The, the Galatians were saved. So it is possible for someone to reject eternal security and still be saved. There's a lot of men today, a lot of Baptist men who have the right gospel, who are saying if, that if you don't believe in eternal security, they're saying you're lost because you're adding works to the gospel, which that is adding works. To say that you can lose your salvation, that's adding works. It is. There's no doubt about that. But a person who denies eternal security could still be saved. Because if they, if there was a moment when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, put their trust in Him, then they're saved. It doesn't matter if they got deceived after salvation into believing they could lose it or not. They're still saved because what you do and what you think or say after salvation ain't got nothing to do with your salvation itself. A man could be deceived into teaching baptismal regeneration or adding works to the gospel of any kind, and he could still be saved, but only if there was a time when they believed on Jesus Christ from the heart. That's what settles all of these questions that I'm answering this. Is there a time when that person believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and put their trust in Jesus Christ to save them and get them to heaven? If they did that, it does not matter what they did before salvation. It doesn't matter what they did after salvation. They are saved and going to heaven when they die. But they, if, these, if they're teaching a false gospel and they believed on Jesus Christ at one point, they're saved and yet deceived. So what I'm trying to tell you is saved people are not safe from deception. They aren't safe from being led astray into heresy and even end up teaching the same heresy themselves. But what about a Church of Christ cult member? You know, that teaches baptismal regeneration you know the average uh, bible believer would say these people are lost and most likely most of them probably are lost sadly but could someone who teaches baptismal regeneration really be saved yes they could i know men personally who believe just like me and you they were led astray by false preachers of the church of christ cult and ended up believing themselves that water baptism is required for salvation. They were saved but deceived. And the main reason that this happens is Baptists many times are lazy with doctrine. They're lazy with reading the Bible. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know why they believe the King James Bible even though they use it. They don't know why they believe in eternal security even though that that's what they believe. They don't know why they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. They just listen to the preacher. They never get into the Bible for themselves. And then uh, a false de deceiver comes along and he uh, gives them a false gospel, gives them some false teachings. And they'll be like, wow, this guy really knows the Bible. And they're led astray. Because, you know, a lot of heretics read the Bible. They study the Bible. Like the Church of Christ called. They, they, they read the Bible. They study the Bible. They're completely wrong on it. But they do read it. They know their bad doctrine more than the average Baptist knows his right doctrine. And that's why they can lead people astray. But you see, those people may not have even heard of this false gospel until this point. That they were presented, that it was printed, presented to them by the Church of Christ cult member. And at one point in their life, they had already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're saved, and yet they're deceived. Because a Christian is not saved from deception. But it all goes back to, did they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, well, if they were really saved, then, then what? If you say that they, if they were really saved, then they wouldn't end up believing that false gospel. 
But if you say that, then you're no different from the guy that's saying, if you're really saved, then you wouldn't drink, chew, or hang out with them that do. You're just saying if they are really saved, then they would never be deceived in that way. Okay, are you adding something? Sounds like you're adding something, just like those other guys. Okay, then why were the Galatians deceived into thinking that it was believe and be circumcised to be saved? You see, back then it was believe on Jesus Christ and be circumcised. Now it's many times believe on Jesus Christ and be water baptized. That's what they're saying now. But the quick answer to all these questions is if there was a time when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you sincerely believed from the heart, then you're as good as in heaven as Jesus Christ himself because you're in him. And whatever you teach or say or do after salvation is a completely separate issue. But if you use this grace as an excuse to sin, then, I mean, you're a low-down dog to just use the grace of God as, as an excuse to sin. And we are low-down dogs. It's only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we get to go to heaven, not anything that we're doing. And I'm in no way promoting you to sin or to teach false gospels and false doctrine. You know, I have studies against these same false gospels. But just because someone is teaching something wrong does not automatically mean they are lost. If a man is teaching a false gospel, mark him and avoid him and have no company with him, no matter who he is. I mean, if a Christian is living in sin, have no company with him. I mean, you're not supposed to be hanging out with people that's doing bad stuff anyway. But it doesn't mean that they're lost. But another brother sent me an email asking about reprobates. Can a reprobate be saved? And the reason I'm putting all these in the same study is because all this kind of goes together. You know, there's so much talk about who's saved and who's not saved and things are keeping people from getting saved and things are proving people aren't saved. And that's all you're hearing. And you're not really hearing the doctrines of salvation anymore. You're hearing judging about... All you're hearing is preachers judging who's saved and who's lost, exposing all the heretics and calling them lost. And he's lost because he's doing this, and he's lost because he's doing that. You don't hardly hear the preachers just get up and teach the doctrines of salvation anymore. Maybe if they would do that more, then there would be less of this heresy going on. But he asked me about reprobates. That, and so I'm putting all these in an email together. And I think all of these questions will help all of these people, even though, uh, you know, I've answered three different questions from three different people so, so far. But I think everybody that, that doesn't know that salvation, doesn't have it settled yet, all of these questions and answers will help them. So he asks, can a reprobate be saved? Or is there ever a time when a person becomes unable to be saved? The quick answer to that is no. And if you say there is a time when someone can sin their way out of the day of grace or reject too many times or commit a certain sin so much that they lost their chance, then you are doing the reverse of what we have already been talking about. While many think that a Christian who sins can lose their salvation, many think that a Christian who sins didn't ever really get salvation, they make it about a man's works after he's saved. Then you have the reverse where a man says a reprobate can't get saved or you can reject too many times and god won't save you and this just makes it be about works before salvation so far we've been talking about people that adding works after salvation to stay saved or to prove salvation now we're talking about people adding works before salvation but first john 2 2 says and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world this verse settles it for me if he died for the sins of the whole world then he died for the sins of the whole world and that would include any reprobate if he died for the sins of the whole world then he died for the sins of the sodomite he died for every sex pervert every sex pervert ever he died for them he died for every time a person rejected him every time that like say a person rejected him a thousand times he died for those a thousand times and they could still be saved romans ten thirteen says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved if you say a reprobate can't get saved then it's no longer whosoever 
Many people make it whosoever will as long as they aren't reprobate or haven't rejected too many times, haven't committed an unpardonable sin, haven't been a sex pervert, and the list goes on and on and on. There is always someone saying a certain person or people is doomed out there just because of something or something that they did. There's always someone saying a person or people never got saved to start with. Always somebody judging somebody's salvation. Romans one twenty eight. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. If someone is turned over to a reprobate mind, I don't see where it says they can't be reversed when they realize their guilt of sin and turn to Jesus Christ and believe on Him. Israel was put away by the Lord, but this doesn't mean they won't be restored. Just because God gave them over doesn't mean He wouldn't take them back. Uh, or, or allow them to be saved, you see. Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So a reprobate mind, what is, what is it? it's just that, it's a state of mind. Romans 1, 28 said they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now, it's very possible that someone could reject Jesus Christ and go, get so deep in their iniquity and love for that sin that they no longer even think about eternity or salvation or God. But it's not God's fault that they did that. And, and if they did turn to Jesus Christ for salvation, then he would take them. You know, you get the idea that these preachers are getting up and saying that well, they've been turned over, over to a reprobate mind. And, and even if they turn to Jesus Christ, God won't save them. That is stupid. And that goes completely against plain verses. So it's like this, if a rep, they, see, they are now saying that they know who the reprobates are. And they say a sodomite is a reprobate, a homosexual. So you're telling me if a homosexual came to you and said they wanted to be saved, they realized their guilt of sin, they wanted to be saved, you're going to say, right, no, you can't get saved, you're a reprobate. That is completely stupid. If somebody knows that they're a sinner, and they know that they're going to hell, and they know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, was buried and resurrected, and they want to be saved, God has his arms out with open arms, salvation in his hand like a free gift saying, please take it. God wants them to be saved. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All means all for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It, the, the reprobate doctrine is almost Calvinistic to me because they're saying that that person's damned and there's nothing they can do about it. That, that's what that reminds me of. That's just what comes to mind to me. I'm not saying it is, but that's just what it sounds like to me. Is, you know, that person's already damned. And, you know, that's just that just don't settle right with me that you're saying a person can't get saved when they want to get saved. Now I'm not saying that there's not people out there that ha that don't retain God in their knowledge. They're not thinking about God. They want nothing to do with God. Yeah, that person's going to hell. But I'm talking about these people that they're saying is a reprobate yet they want to be saved. This stuff makes me mad. I don't know about you, but to tell somebody they can't be saved is complete stupidity. Uh, John six thirty seven says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Sounds pretty plain. How do you just write off all these simple verses of Scripture that plainly show you that God receives everybody that comes to him? It's whosoever will. And when you add an exception, then it starts to not be whosoever will anymore. And people use these verses like Genesis 6, 3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. Many will use this verse to say that God will come to a point where he will no longer deal with you, and you'll be doomed forever. And I, I heard a preacher when I was a little kid saying, I'm talking about a woman that had rejected so many times, and one night she stayed up all night crying and begging God for mercy and to save her, and God wouldn't save her because she crossed some deadline. That is stupidity at its finest. He needs to go back and read the Bible. That's discouraging a lot of people from getting saved. And there's people 
that that sit up all night worrying about this doubt their salvation have no assurance of salvation because the preachers don't spend much time teaching the doctrines of salvation they're too busy trying to scare people and too busy trying to tell people who's saved and who ain't saved but many will use that verse to try to say that God will come to a point where he'll no longer deal with them but this directed to a, a wick, this is directed to a wicked world during the days of Noah not to a lost sinner today you know this has nothing to do with New Testament salvation in Genesis 6 3 stop and think for a minute before you say stupid stuff if a lost sinner knows they're going to hell and desires to be saved and is calling on the name of the Lord do you what kind of God do you serve do you think he's gonna turn them away when he died on the cross he lived a sinless life left heaven lived a sinless life, died on the cross for their sins, and a lost sinner is going to come to him wanting to be saved, and you're going to say that God's going to turn him away? Get out of here. Imagine the Lord saying no. And then the lost sinner says, I thought it was a free gift, God. Would the Lord say, well, it's free, but you did this and this and this and this and that, and you should have done this. I mean, that's like the TV preacher saying, we'll send you this free gift as long as you send in your $50 donation to our ministry. How is it free if you got to send in $50? How is salvation free if you had, had to abstain from a certain sin to be able to be eligible to get it? The more free you make salvation, the more people will hate you because sinful man wants to have a part in his own salvation and you ain't got no part in it if you're saved. Jesus did it all. He did all the work. He paid all the price. He keeps you. You don't keep yourself. Paul says in Galatians 6.12, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Paul's suffering persecution because he wasn't adding anything to the gospel. It makes people mad. Like even a person who lives like the devil but has kind of like a, a, a church background or maybe their parents went to church or something. If when they talk to you about the Bible and, you know, the question comes up, can you lose your salvation? They're living like the devil, yet you're sitting there reading your Bible. They'll get mad at, mad at you for saying you believe once saved, always saved. They're like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't believe that. I don't believe that a person can just go to heaven when he lives like the devil. And I'm thinking... Well, you're the one over here cussing and don't even show anybody that you're saved. And you're yet you're for, you, you believe in eternal insecurity? Aren't you worried about going to hell when you act that way? But I mean, even people that live like the devil are against eternal security many times. Because man wants to have a part in his salvation, and he doesn't. The only part you have in it is you either accept it or you reject it. You you choose to be saved or you choose not to be saved. <clears throat> so remembering that the things you do before salvation and the things you do after salvation are separate issues from the salvation itself. Simply what I believe is that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse any sin ever committed no matter how many times it was committed. Whether it be any type of sex, sexual sin. Notice sexual sins by many people, they act like those are unforgivable sins. There's something about that. Uh, many times people believe a divorce, they act like a divorced person. That's the worst type of sin you could commit for many people. You know, all these different things that people say, well, that's an unpardonable sin. But blood of Jesus can cleanse us from all sin. This brother also asked, the, another brother also asked the question about the unpardonable sin. Nowadays, people say cussing God or something like that is an unpardonable sin. But that isn't what the unpardonable sin is when you read the verses. In Mark three twenty-eight through 30, it says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Notice it says in danger of it. First thing. Because now look at what it is. What is the unpardonable sin? Right here he says it in verse 30. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So the sin wasn't cussing God. It wasn't denying the Holy Spirit. It wasn't rejecting the invitation to come to the altar. 
It was when Jesus Christ was walking around on earth and they accused him of having an unclean spirit and casting out devils by the power of the devil. And they said he had an unclean spirit. Notice verse 30 said, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Now, how many times or have you even heard of somebody saying that Jesus had an unclean spirit? That's what the unpardonable sin was. Now, it's not just that. You see, that's a that's a very rare thing. I, I mean, I've never heard of somebody saying Jesus has an unclean spirit. But that's not all this is about. Also, remember, this is before Jesus Christ even died for the sins of the whole world. This is before the New Testament even started. I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, the four Gospels, that's in the New Testament. But the New Testament does not really start until Jesus dies on the cross, according to Hebrews. It doesn't start until the death of the testator. But in Matthew twelve thirty one through 32, talking about the same event, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall never or shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh it against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. The world to come is the millennium. Think about that. The millennium, which also just happens to be a time when Jesus Christ is walking on the earth where everybody can visibly see him, just like he was when they said he had an unclean spirit. So this unpardonable sin has to do with saying Jesus Christ hath an unclean spirit. And it was something that only happened when Jesus is on earth walking in the flesh where people can see him. And even if it isn't, this still isn't something that, this is still something that took place before Jesus died on the cross. And we're in a different setup now than they were then. The New Testament doesn't even start until the death of the testator and the test there is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't believe there is any unpardonable sin that could keep a man from believing on Jesus Christ and being saved today. And if you say that there is, good for you, add works to the gospel. You're no better than the people that Paul was talking about in Galatians 1, 8, and 9. And a lot of people will listen to this and then they'll say, I'm not saved for what I'm saying in this. That's how stupid they are. And that is, is how messed up they are on salvation. They don't understand a free gift. F-R-E-E-G-I-F-T. Free gift. And I mean, I hate to be mean or kind of sound mean ab ab about this, but I'm, it's just very frustrating because you hear all these, these people, these preachers, teachers, whoever, they have no idea what they're talking about. They discourage people. They mess with people's assurance of salvation. They never talk about the doctrines of salvation. They never explain them. They just go around pointing the finger, telling people that everybody's not saved, making people doubt their salvation, telling them the person that led them to the Lord isn't even saved. That's how warped these people are. And I'm, it's just very frustrating. And when I start talking about these things, it, I'm just reminded of how frustrated I am about it. But once again, I'm in no way excusing you of any pet sin on your part. There are some things you can lose. But it isn't salvation. It is inheritance in the kingdom. It is earned rewards. You can lose rewards. You know, you can lose the joy of salvation. But you can't lose your salvation. You can lose your health. You know, you can lose things on this earth. But you can't lose salvation. But another person sent me an email asking, what is the difference between inheritance and salvation? So I figured this is a great time after I've already explained, you know, a lot to go ahead and explain that because that's what we just saw in Galatians 5.21. Galatians 5.21 shows us that believers who commit these those that long list of sins, just stay in that type of sin, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But that doesn't say you'll lose salvation. It doesn't say you'll go to hell. It said you won't inherit the kingdom of God. So this means you won't have inheritance in the kingdom. The millennial kingdom. When both kingdoms are present because the king of both kingdoms is there on the throne. You'd still go in the kingdom. But if you live for the flesh, you'll lose, you'll lose your inheritance. In Ephesians 5, 2 through 5 it says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, 
but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See that? Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. This inheritance is not salvation, but an earned reward for living for God. Now look at Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So the difference between salvation and inheritance is that salvation is a free gift and inheritance is something you can earn. But there is an inheritance that each believer automatically gets at salvation as well. That is already reserved for you in heaven, according to 1 Peter 1 4. So you have an inheritance reserved for you, and you did nothing to get that one. You didn't know you didn't know about it, but you got it. But then there's an inheritance you can get, and you'll get it in the millennial kingdom. It's an earned reward. So think about just to sum up everything I've said, really, think about it like this. Jesus Christ left heaven. He fulfilled all righteousness according to Matthew 3.15. He lived a perfect life without sin because you could not. He became the perfect sacrifice for sin because you didn't have one. He did all the work. You have to believe. And then he gives you his righteousness. That's imputed righteousness. One of the things these preachers don't talk about, imputed righteousness. They're too busy telling you you're not saved because you did this and you're not saved because you did that and this guy's not saved and the guy that led you to the Lord's not saved. None of these people are saved except me is what they're saying. You know, you come to it comes to the point where, you know, it's, who's saved except you, buddy? But it's like, it, you know, Jesus gives you his righteousness. That's imputed righteousness. Your righteousness before and after salvation has nothing to do with you getting to heaven. And Paul even says in Romans 3.10, For there is none righteous, no, not one. If the righteousness that gets you to heaven is the righteousness you got from Jesus Christ, then what does your righteousness have anything to do with it at all? It, if you couldn't do anything to deserve salvation before you were saved, then how could you do anything after salvation to deserve it? Galatians 2.21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you could do good enough to keep it or earn it, then Jesus died in vain. So my answer to sum up all of these questions is, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you put your trust on Him to be your Savior. You're saved. It doesn't matter what you did before salvation. It doesn't matter what you've done after salvation. And all these big mouth preachers, are just a bunch of big bullies going around making people afraid. I don't know why they do it, but I mean, who cares what they say? We see what the Bible says. We're saved by grace through faith without works, plainly. And what you did before salvation is a separate issue from salvation. What you do after salvation is a separate issue from salvation. But I hope that this, uh, I hope I didn't get too mean or, or say, you know, say some things out of the way but you got to understand how frustrating it is seeing everybody you know everybody is doesn't have assurance of salvation because people aren't teaching the doctrines of salvation anymore all they're saying is going around saying that's accusing people of being lost that's about all they're doing anymore but i hope these answers help some people